Hello, my name is Cliff Hawkins. I'm a scientist. I, my interest is in food and food intolerance and allergy. And I want to just talk briefly about the autoimmune consequences of food intolerance. I want to emphasize to you I'm not a medico. I am a scientist with my science background in medical chemistry. My degree, PhD, is in medical chemistry. And I've spent now a, a, many, many years now looking at how food causes a problem with the immune system, working both with humans and with animals and working with some of the top people in the world in this relationship between food and autoimmune di disease. Biohawk really focuses on food. We, we, are, we do not focus on any disease as such. We do research into various diseases, but we don't sell our products to treat any food. What we do do is sell our products to treat food so that the food no longer is a problem for people who are sensitive to the food. And in doing that, we actually are able to assist people deal with their autoimmune consequences of food intolerance. Now, I know you don't think you're a chicken, but I think it's important for you to just look at these two chickens here. And you have to ask yourself, which chicken do you want to be? If you've got food intolerance, you're that chicken there. And this is a normal commercial chicken that you buy at the supermarket. It is not really able to eat the food that's given and have no reaction. The food, all the chickens have the gene recognized as bile-rich proteins and they have a serious reaction to their food. Their legs, you can see here this chicken has uh, legs which are all knobbly and not very strong. In fact, this chicken lies down in the shed for a large part of the day because its legs can't hold it up too well. And that comes about because the food is not digested properly inside the animal and causes autoimmune reactions. And also its hindgut it gets a bad bacterial population and causes problems to the tendon development and to the bone structure. And so this is one consequence of food, the wrong food being eaten by the chicken. And secondly, it's got diarrhea. You can see it's got diarrhea. It has not matured properly. Underneath this wing, there's a breast which has got a large amount of fat and, and not a really good muscle development. The chicken producer makes uh, a small amount of money from producing that chicken. And uh, when you cook it, you get a greasy hand if you bake it because of all that fat on the chicken. And so it's stressed throughout its life as people with food intolerance are stressed. And if you were to walk into the shed with this chicken, the chicken would run away from you because you are a foreign invader coming into a shed and it's so stressed with its immune system, hypersensitized that it will run away from you. It will not enjoy life in its shed. It won't flap around and love it running around the shed because its legs won't be able to let it do that. And it's not feeling well. But that compare this chicken to this chicken. This chicken is exactly the same as that chicken. It's in the same set of sheds in the same farm. It's got the same genetics. It has the same food. It has the same availability of water. But in this one, it's got the ginger enzyme in the water, or the ginger product in the water. And this is after 22 days on the ginger. You will see the legs are perfect. They're beautiful legs. No distortion like this. They, they can run around all day flapping their wings. They're as happy as Larry. They're not stressed. You can walk into the shed. They'll come up and pick around your feet. They, they don't see you as a threat. They're beautifully matured. They have no diarrhea. They have beautiful meat on their breast. The farmer can make twice as much net profit from that chicken than for that chicken. And all that has happened is that the protein which is probably which is digested before the animal consumes it, in a sense. So in the digestive system, there is an enzyme now present which will digest the pyrrhic protein, where previously there was no enzyme present which could digest the pyrrhic protein, so they were not getting the nutrition out of the grains they were given. 
and the, all they were getting was the immune system being damaged and the proteins going through to the hind gut, the food going through to the hind gut where it was cemented, causing major health problems. So you have to work out which chicken do you want to be. If you want to continue to be this one, then eat the food you're still eating. This food has been developed over many years as the best food for that chicken. But I'm saying it's not the best food for that chicken, it's hurting that chicken. And you need to get a food where the chicken can digest it more efficiently. The, the cause of food intolerance in food is the fact that the foods that we eat today have what's called polyrich proteins. The, a large percentage of the proteins in the food have multiple amino acids called proline. This is a proline here. The proline differs from all other amino acids in that it has a cyclic component to it. You see this blue one's a nitrogen and it goes carbon, 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 nitrogen. So this five membered ring, which is relatively planar, is fixed in space and the side group, this carbonyl group here, goes off at 90 degrees roughly. So you have a planar group fixed with a 90 degree bend which is fixed. And so if you have such an amino acid, it loses the flexibility which is normally in amino acids. Amino acids are small parts of proteins, they're the building block of proteins, and they're usually very, very flexible except for this proline. And if you have many of those polines in a protein, because you've got this 90 degree fixed structure, the enzymes that we have in our body to break down proteins are not designed to be able to break down something which is so fixed and indeed it relies a, they rely on the ability of the protein they're going to break down to be flexible so that the enzyme can come in and start cutting up the protein very efficiently. But when it's fixed in this structure our normal digestive enzymes that we produce and other animals produce that's not capable of breaking down the protein. And uh, plants have these proteins encapsulating all their nutrition, their starch, their oils, their vitamins, their minerals, and so we don't take up those nutrients that we should. And instead the food goes down to the hind gut which causes a health problem. People who have this gene, HLA, human leukocyte antigen, DQ2 or DQ8 or ones related to them in, inherit they, they pass on this gene 100% to their children and in Australia more than 30% of Australians have that gene in some parts of Australia it's much much more than 30% uh, but uh, certainly the studies that have been done show that it's in excess of 30% and this particular gene recognizes only proline rich proteins. And these proteins are in milk and in plant based foods and on the membranes of viruses and bacteria. Indeed, people with that gene have the gene because they come from the uh, Stone Age people who relied on that gene to protect them against viruses and bacteria. They, they evolved to have that gene so they are protected against virus and bacteria. But if you have that gene and it gets switched on in utero by stress on the mother or by some other infection or something in the mother, if her genes turn on and she turns on the baby's gene, and then there's a serious problem because the baby when it emerges will not want to latch onto the mother's breast because it recognizes that the mother's milk has casein in it and it doesn't want to suffer from that, so the baby doesn't like to latch onto the mother. And then it's given formula which is worse and a whole health problem emerges for the baby. It can be turned on by stress, which is the most common way, and that stress could be through just excessive exercise. I'm not saying don't exercise, I'm saying if you do excessive ex exercise, then you're likely to turn on that gene if you have it. You can have it turned on by your first infection, like a virus or bacteria, and then after that you're protected against virus and bacteria. Or it can be turned on by a vaccination. I want to emphasize I'm not against vaccinations for serious diseases. I think we have to protect people from such diseases. 
and a vaccination is designed to not only to protect it in one way through the so-called T2 helper cell immunity process, it actually is designed to ensure that you have uh, natural killer cells that can, that can attack the virus and bacteria and other ways in which it can stop the infection happening. But it is a way in which you can have this gene turned on and, um, and that's because the actual vaccine is designed to include the proteins on the membrane of the virus and bacterium and those pro proteins are all polyrich. rich and so any vaccination against an infection will have polyrich proteins it will have a whole mix of proteins because not only the people with food intolerance need to be vaccinated, everyone needs to be vaccinated and if, if anyone doesn't need to be vaccinated then the people with this gene are the ones who don't need to be vaccinated because they have a natural immunity against polymerase proteins once it's turned on. Once you have it switched on <coughs> and you eat food rich in polymerase proteins, then your immune system will get hypersensitized. And it's important to recognize you can go through all your life, have the gene, have it switched on, but if you don't eat food which is rich in polymerase proteins, then you won't you have your immune system hypersensitized, you won't have any autoimmune consequences, you'll, you'll live a, a life which is, is perfect in a sense, that you won't be infected by the flu or, or common cold or any virus because you have your gene turned on, but you haven't got it hypersensitized because you very carefully select your food. And that's what happened uh, in the Stone Age times. The people were very conscious of the fact they had to eat only foods that didn't give them a health problem, where now we, we eat foods based on a whole range of things, not, not recognising that the, some foods will hurt our health very much. The immune response is against invading um, molecules such as the food proteins, and if you have what's called a APC antigen presenting cell that recognises the polymer rich proteins, it will put it on its surface to tell the body start to protect yourself and your stem cells create T cells that actually bind to that foreign molecule and once that binds to the foreign molecule it puts out proteins called cytokines and those cytokines are either peptides or proteins and they are sent out to turn on other immune cells like B cells and those B cells put out immunoglobulins IgG or IgE or IgM or IgA and so on and those immunoglobulins are there to help in the immunity process <coughs> and they bind for example the IgG which is the food intolerant immunoglobulin binds to the foreign molecule in your blood and actually forms what's called immunocomplex and you have white cells that are sort of gobble up that immunocomplex and wall it off so you're not going to be hurt. That's your normal immunity. Or it will actually wall off a, a, a virus or a bacteria, but it will just, it will actually consume the problem once the IgG is bound to the antigen. And the second molecule, IgE, which is an allergen, and um, we're not concentrating in this talk about the IgE molecule, but it's re released and it can cause you an allergic reaction to food proteins. If you, if you have this reaction between the APC, the antigen presenting cell, and the T cell becoming much more common in your body, then you put out a lot more of these cytokines, and these cytokines you know, what's called a cytokine flux, and these turn on all sorts of cells in your body. Other cells which are genes for possess genes for, say, multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis or cancer or so on. And so once you have a high concentration of this in your body and these cells, you run the risk of autoimmune disease. And the only way you can solve that problem is to calm down your immune system so the concentration of cytokines is reduced dramatically. I want to talk about in some detail the digestion of food which is containing polymerase proteins in people with the HLA DQ2 or DQ18. When that food which is 
the whole food, not digested food. Pre-digested food goes into the mouth and, and into the gastrointestinal tract. Very quickly the immune system gets turned on. And because your immune system recognizes the point which proteins, and once it recognizes those point which proteins, they'll put out um, cytokines and immunoglobulins. And those cytokines and immunoglobulins then can go into your blood. The food goes into the stomach. The stomach is not all that efficient for breaking down these sorts of foods. The pancreas puts out enzymes and acids which goes into the stomach and starts the digestion. But the enzymes put out by the pancreas cannot break down polyrich proteins. So the polyrich proteins and the nutrients encapsulated by the polyrich proteins are not, uh, not easily digested. They go into the small intestine again, they're not digested there. The polyrich proteins go into the blood through a leaky gut situation. They can go into the cerebral spinal fluid. The autoimmune genes get turned on by a cytokine flux from the immune system. And the, the cytokines, immunoglobulins and the other polyrich proteins all go up through the blood system, the cerebral spinal fluid that can go up to the brain and inflame the brain and turn on autoimmune genes within the brain. You've got a serious health problem coming on when that happens. The food now, which is not really digested, goes through into the hindgut. And um, ten, somewhere between uh, 10 or 40% or of the food gets digested and goes into the blood as nutrients which are healthier. But 90 to 60 percent of the food goes through the large intestine. And in the large intestine, you have like a volcano because the bacteria in the large intestine can ferment that food and put out uh, acid and wrong fatty acids and a whole range of toxins. And those toxins can go into blood and cause you a problem. And that bacterial fermentation causes all the good bacteria to disappear. The pH drops down less than 6.2 and only the bad bacteria culture and you've got a health problem coming from the large intestine. And of course now the food, 90 to 40% of the food goes in the large intestine. The large proportion of it goes through the anus and you could get constipation because of the blockage of the anus. Now if you uh, digest the food before you eat it by breaking down the point which proteins, now all the nutrients are available to be taken up. So when you swallow the food, it goes into the esophagus, the immune system it just stays at the normal level. It doesn't get hypersensitized. When it goes into the stomach, you still have a problem with the enzymes put out by the pancreas and the acid. It doesn't break it down a lot, but now when it gets to the large, the small intestine, you, you have no autoimmune gene turned on, and the small intestine can absorb it very efficiently because the proteins are all broken down, the, uh, the carbohydrates are available for digestion in the small intestine. The minerals and vitamins are easily taken up in the small intestine. And you have um, a very efficient digestion taking place in the small intestine. In terms of the food going through, nearly 100%, not totally, but near 100% of the food is taken up as nutri nutrition into your blood and helps develop your body. There's a very little part of it, which is the fiber goes through into your large intestine and that's what's supposed to go into the large intestine and now your good bacteria can digest that fibre in your large intestine and does not cause the pH to drop down and you have a healthy bacterial, po bacterial population in the hindgut which gives you good health and this of course now because there's only fibre the, the residue that goes through the anus is very easily passed out and if you were to get a, a toilet brush and hit your stools, they just fall apart because they're, they're just fine, but they haven't got all the fat and carbohydrate and protein in them, and you shouldn't suffer from constipation. You'll, you will not have firm stools, but you will have soft stools, which um, won't cause you a constipation problem, which is common for people with food intolerance. Now here I just refer to ZB as the ginger, so ZB is zinc abrasia. The, the ginger was able to break down the polyrich protein and allow digestion to happen as it was intended to happen in terms that you notice are enormous. You get reflux. And in fact, my little Irish mother 
died from reflux in the sense that the reflux caused a, a ball artery in her, in her esophagus to dissolve away and she bled to death from that. And so it's quite common for people to have reflux and women tell me that they have reflux and men have excess wind but the, both of those are, are signs of food intolerance. People with food intolerance always have a pain in the gut but a lot of people have a pain in the gut because if your food goes through to your hindgut undigested, as most people, that's the case, then they uh, will get a pain in the gut from that. Diarrhea or constipation is common for people with food intolerance. They feel tired because the cytokines, especially a cytokine called trimonocrosis factor alpha, competes with insulin for binding to glucose. Insulin is meant to take glucose and put it into energy cells. But trimonocrosis factor alpha stops that. It competes with insulin and stops the glucose going to energy cells. So you feel tired and in fact it can, it can develop into what's called chronic fatigue. And um, it's a very serious problem for people with food intolerance. Because the proteins and, and the peptides and the cytokines and the immunoglobulins going up to your brain are inflaming your brain and you'll get a fuzzy head. And so most people recognise that their head is fuzzy when they've got food intolerance. With eczema, it's a very common problem for people with food intolerance. I'll see irritations on their skin, and one of them is eczema. And, and that is a, a consequence, a normal symptom of food intolerance, as you'll see. You can get damage to your gut. You get what's called irritable bowel. You can get Crohn's disease. You can get ulcers. And uh, these things... Um, come from the fact that the immunoglobulin produced by the immune system, the IgG, is looking for a polyrich protein. And that polyrich protein is actually in the protein lining of your gut. But you're supposed to eat foods which give you a, a protective coating, like a lipoprotein, or, uh, or you know, something which will coat your, coat your gut wall so that the immunoglobulins can't damage your own uh, gut wall. But if you don't have eat the right food, then you're likely not to have a good protection of your gut wall and the immunoglobulins will bind to the polymerase proteins in your gut and the pac men will come along and try to gobble up the immunocomplex, the, the immuno IgG and the polymerase protein which happens to be a part of you and by doing that it damages your gut and bacteria can lodge in that damage and then that can create a bigger problem for you. So that's a part of, of the autoimmune consequence from food intolerance in that sense. Now, what, if you have food intolerance, the fat, you, you do produce a fat which is different to the other fat you get, and that fat is laid down on women's breasts and on their bottoms and on their thighs and on men's stomachs. And um, it's, a, it's a problem because there's this feeling that, that people who are fat laid down this way are eating too much and not exercising too much, it's got nothing to do with it they've got food intolerance, then that fat will be laid down. It's like as if they're being protected by that fat. And uh, the only way they can lose that fat is not through exercise, it's by, by changing their diet. And once they change their diet, then that fat can go off you. But if you don't change your diet, you'll keep it on there. And so you can go to the gym seven days a week, you will not lose that fat. And that's the easiest way to see if you've got a food intolerance problem you'll see your body start to lay fat down in places that you don't appreciate. And lastly, if you, if you have a, your immune system highly sensitised, you'll suffer allergies from everything that goes past your nose. Knows every flower puts out, whether it be a, a native flower or, a, or an exotic flower, it will produce a polymerase protein that will stimulate your immune system and you'll have problems from dust mites and everything around the place. And so it's important for you to get your immune system calmed down so you don't suffer from the immune system being so sensitised that you have allergies to everything. These autoimmune diseases are turned on by food intolerance, by the cytokine flux that turns on all the genes. The first one that's turned on, especially women's thyroid disease, and they're, they're given different names to the various thyroid diseases, but they're the first turned on and they're the easiest turned off in a sense by getting your immune system calmed down so that the gene for the thyroid disease is turned off. Rheumatism is a bit like that as well. 
autism is something which we've been focusing on. Uh, the people who first studied the link between food and the, and the, the food's proteins and the food's proteins transport up to the brain. Uh, the group in Norway is one of the first groups under Carl Weichelt and they have studied at the molecular level how the brain gets inflamed by this food intolerance and by the proteins and peptides which are proline rich and um, I'll talk about autism in a moment but it's an area of, of research interest to us here and we're working closely with a group in Europe. Multiple stresses is one where the immunoglobulin that goes is produced, the IgG produced from food intolerance is transported, actively transported up to the brain and can damage the the myelin coating, the white matter coating of the neurons and they they are proline rich and the immunoglobulin is bind to those and cause a lesion and that lesion can be thankfully be repaired if you just stop the gene producing the immunoglobulin which is going up and damaging the brain actually has cells which when it's activated these macrophages can start healing the lesions caused by multiple stresses. I want to concentrate a bit about subfertility, I'll mention that shortly. There are others like diabetes and nerval bowel and lupus and cancers and schizophrenia, all these autoimmune diseases but there are over 200 and all of them are related to the fact that the food hypersensitized immune system and the cytokine flux turns on other genes that you have and those genes have to be turned back off again by getting your immune system calm right down to normal. I want to focus just on a couple of areas of interest to us. It's uh, a literature on what's called unexplained subfertility it is quite rich and what has been found is that if people have a hypersensitized immune system through food intolerance then if you remove from your diet those foods such as gluten and dairy your reproductive organisms can repair themselves and you're able to conceive a child. If people have food intolerance both the male or one or either the male or the woman or both have food intolerance but then their ability to reproduce is reduced down tremendously and that's becoming a serious problem in Australia that about 20% of the couples aren't able to have a child because of food intolerance and that will continue to grow and by 2030 people are using different methods have predicted that it could grow in Australia to something like 60%. Now that is a serious health problem for Australia and they have to understand that you have to come to terms with food intolerance. And so what we suggest to people is that if you're going to if you want to conceive a child, have a healthy child, then it's like going into play rugby union in the sense that before you run on the field you have to go into training for three months. And I'm not saying you go and train how to have sex, that's not the problem. The problem is get your body fit for carrying out a, a, a healthy conception. And to do that you have to ensure that your hypersensitized immune system has come down and if it's not come down you are likely not to have a successful pregnancy you will not have the full term pregnancy and the child will emerge with a whole range of problems so it's crucial for anyone who plans to have a child to go into a program where I call the training three months to get your immune system calmed down so you, you can have a healthy pregnancy second phase in those two years in your child's life is during the pregnancy if, if the mother has conceived a child then you don't want to get her immune system highly sensitized during the pregnancy so the mother has to be kept calm in that sense and nothing can be done to the mother which will excite her immune system so the fetus develops normally and the baby is born with its immune system not hypersensitized so the baby latches onto the mother's breast. I mean that is the most important step of all. That when the baby emerges at full term, it is able to drink the mother's milk, which has been designed by nature to be the perfect food for the for the baby. But if the baby emerges with its immune system turned on, it won't latch on successfully to the mother. 
and then the baby's health is at risk. During the pregnancy, the brain starts to develop, but it doesn't develop a long way along the process. The brain can't be filled up with all this white matter and so on if it's going to emerge out of the mother. So once the baby is born, the, there is a developmental process takes place, and especially in the first 12 months, which is crucial for the life of the baby. It has to develop all its brain white matter, and that has to protect the neurons. You have to get the two hemispheres of brain joined together. You have to get the skull firmly closed over. You have to, and it has to develop the, the knack of eating, the ability to move, the ability to communicate. You have to get the bones starting, the, the cells that produce good bones have to be developed. In this 12 months, you have to have tendons start to develop and strengthen. You have to have ligaments develop. You have to have muscle cells, because if you don't get your muscle cells developed, in this period then they, they'll never develop well and so to do that you have to have the really correct nutrition throughout this 12 month period without stimulating the immune system so if the baby has its gene turned on by a vaccination or by some other problem you have to recognize that somehow you have to get the immune system calmed down to a normal level so that the baby can take in that nutrition and, and not eat food which has got poison which brought in so its immune system stays calm down so no autoimmune condition is switched on because you can have an autoimmune switched on which will stop the brain developing I mean it's, it's just a serious thing that children's brains might be stopped by an autoimmune consequence of food intolerance and then, then there is a very serious implications for the future of the child so it's, this two year program is starts three months before conception then you want to have a, a very successful nine months pregnancy and then the next 12 months you have to make sure the nutrition is as good as you possibly can have so the baby's developmental steps all happen in the 12 month pro program I just want to show you uh, some more protein structures it's important for you to understand that there is some similarity being the, between the protein say on wheat proteins, and here there are two, gliadin and low molecular weight glutenin. These two ones here are parts of the protein of gliadin and low molecular weight glutenin. And you can see Q, Q, Q is blue patch, they're all glutamines. And then red is proline, and then other amino acids and more proline, more proline, more proline. So this is, is gliadin, and this is glutamine, and, and this is glutenin. And up here is one of the more common proteins expressed by breast cancer and other cancers it's called SATB1 and you see this Q, 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 all the glutamines and then you proline, 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 proline. So the, the diseases put out proteins just like the food proteins that cause the problem, that cause the immune system to be stimulated. And this is the bottom one is the, uh, the protein, the most common protein put out by the hormone induced breast cancers. And you see again glutamine, 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 proline, 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 proline. But up the top I've got the gene for the Parkinson's disease. It's also for dementia with little bodies. It's the PARK2 gene. There you go, glutamine, 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 there's a proline here, glutamine, 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 proline, proline, proline. It's very, very similar. And so these diseases put out proteins on the surface of their genes and on the, on the cells which are part of the disease, proteins which are similar to the food proteins because the food proteins are designed to survive within the human and some of these proteins put out by these diseases. Now we can break down the gluten proteins. I've shown, I've shown you we can break down these gluten proteins. And it's, it's similarly you can break down these proteins here. You can give a haircut to these sort of cells. The cells put out, the proteins put out by, say, cancer cells or, or the dementia gene. Now, I just want to show you the impact of digesting food proteins. If you digest the polyrich food proteins, how does that help you? Well, this is a lass with eczema, bad eczema. She'd had for 16 years and she scratched her legs, scratched every part of her body. For 16 years, so much so that she didn't go out very much. 
certainly cover the body very well so no one can see it. But if you digest the prime rich proteins in the food within a week, that all disappears. And she gets a, a leg and an arm and a body which is free of the eczema. That autoimmune consequence of the food intolerance is easily removed if you digest the food, you pre-digest the food before you eat it. Of course, if you do do that, there is no peptide, a primary rich peptide or protein that can cause the autoimmune reaction. And this is this happens also in things like angioedema, where angioedema you get parts of your face all swelling up, and you get lips swollen either the bottom lip or the top lip. And if you pre-digest the, the primary rich proteins within a short period of time, like days, the, all that swelling disappears and you have normal lips and normal face and, and your life is made much easier. But it's just a matter of digesting the food primary rich proteins, no matter how you do it, you will get a reaction like that. And the same with what's called urticaria. Again, if you, if you digest the primary rich proteins in food, you see before the situation and then after, all that irritation goes. In this case, she scratched her leg, so the scar was still there a few days after. But um, it's important to understand that um, you, can, you can get rid of, of these consequences of food intolerance by simply digesting the primary rich proteins. Now lastly I want to talk about autism and the autism spectrum disorder. We're working closely with people in Europe who have been studying this for many, many years and they've shown quite conclusively that people with ASD, if you put them on a gluten-free diet or and a dairy-free diet, and then their traits are reduced down significantly. They don't go down to zero, but they're reduced significantly. And this particular study is a study which looked at it for about four years, but after a year, you can see for this group of uh, children, it's a large group of children, when they, before they had their, they went on a gluten-free and a dairy-free diet, their traits, which are the scores of zero to 10, for aloofness, this is for attention traits, this is, they've got different types of traits and they've got data for those, but I'm just focusing on attention traits. The attention trait, aloofness, was maximum 10. The um, easily distracted trait wasn't so bad, it was about 6. The need, uh, needs routines and rituals trait was about 9, so it's close to 100%, and has problems responding to teaching is 100%. So these children had a serious attention problem. But by going on a gluten-free diet, a diet and a dairy-free diet, those traits reduced down to be much more manageable. The actual has problems responding to teaching stayed up at about six, but the others came down to three. And so there was a major change in the child. But they recognized that just going on a gluten-free diet and dairy-free diet did not solve totally the problem. And so when we suggested that they, they need to break down all the polymerage proteins so that there is no polymerage protein exciting the immune system. So all the food had to have its polymerage proteins broken. Then you can get an improved response. And here I just want to show you in a preliminary data, we're collecting data, looking at the same attention traits and other traits. We're looking at if you digest all the food before you eat, eat it, what will happen? And you see that these children, they all were at the, before you treated the food, they're up near 100%, 90%, 100%. 100%. after one week of treating the food, and after four weeks of treating the food, after eight weeks you're down to scores of one or two where the child is no longer tormented by the brain being inflamed, and they can continue to go down as you do it for a longer period of time. But what their studies have shown is once you get a start to go down, if you take them, put them back onto the food like gluten or dairy, they will go back up again. So you just have to make a commitment to the child that during their life they will have their food pre-digested so that none of the primary rich proteins can enter their mouth and cause their immune system to cause major hassle to that child and send up 
white pills to the brain which inflame the brain. And so what we recommend to my colleagues in Europe and to everyone is that you, you should treat your food to break down the white pills before you eat it and then you have to treat yourself as well. Thank you very much.